You're listening to Language Nerds to Earth, a podcast about linguistics, culture, travel, and how they're all connected. And now it's time to meet your language nerd hosts. One in China, one in Spain. It's Patrice and Rachel. Hi, I'm Patrice. And I'm Rachel. And welcome to Language Nerds to Earth. This is episode number 25. Yeah, and I'm really excited about this one. I don't know about you. Yes. So a while ago, we did the evolution of English, and we had so much information that we decided to break it into multiple episodes. So this is installment two. Yes, and if you haven't heard the episode of English part one, you can go back and listen to episode 16. It's really, really interesting stuff, but you don't need to have listened to episode 16 to understand what we're going to talk about today. Right. They're not, like, dependent on each other. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just a very... Really, really fun. Yeah, and it's a really, really broad topic, so... Mm -hmm. But you should definitely check out episode 16, because it's really fun, too. Yes, it's so fun. So today we're going to talk about two major things. We're going to start with Shakespearean English... Is it British? Is it American? Is it Irish sounding? What did it actually sound like? Yeah. We're going to find out. And then we're also going to talk about the great vowel shift, which is GVS for short. (laughs) (laughs) Useful acronyms. Yeah. Yeah, just throw that into everyday conversation. (laughs) Nobody will think you're weird. <laughs> and then we have a last in translation moment from Rachel in Spain. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but first we've got some language news. Language news. So this week we read an article about a creole. So we've talked about this in a previous episode. But basically when speakers of a different language move to a different area where that language is not spoken, their children form what's called a pidgin. So it doesn't really have grammatical rules, but it kind of mixes the vocabulary and it allows them to communicate and combine the two different languages. But I think it's not just the children. It's also like the people in that area. Right. The adults want to be able to communicate with other adults who speak a different language. Yeah, you're right. And then (laughs) after that, It eventually gains more grammatical structure and vocabulary, I believe, and becomes a creole. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so there is your introduction (laughs) to the language news. So we're going to go to Australia now. There's a new language spoken by millennial aboriginals in Australia. It's in... Lajamanu, probably butchered that, which is Australian's Australia's northern territory, and the new language is called Light Walpiri, and it's less than 40 years old. Most speakers are under 35. Mm-hmm. So Light Walpiri is a fusion of three languages. It's Walpiri, Standard Australian English, and Creole, which is the English lexified Creole. Right, and Creole here is spelled K-R-I-O-L. That's right. It's super interesting, though, because the verbs are from Creole and English, but the grammatical structure is well theory. Right. And so Creoles are created by kind of mixing two different languages out of necessity, you could say. And so this developed from bilingual children code switching. And code switching can be between languages. It can also be between the same language and just switching the kind of words or syntax that you're using. Right, exactly. So the example they used in the article, which was on Atlas Obscura, is when black Americans will use one form of English in white workplaces, and then they'll use like African American vernacular at like family barbecues. So Um, Code switching serves to socially signal ourselves as members of one group versus another and to maybe add flavor to conversations. Right. Would you say that even like maybe talking to an older generation, you might code switch between the way that you talk to your friends? Definitely. Yeah. I think I code switch when I talk to like my grandfather a little bit, just like because I want to be more respectful and use words that he can understand and relate to um Mm -hmm. 
And then I even code switch in the south a little bit, like I can turn on a little bit of a southern accent just to not make myself stand out, you know? Yeah, that's true. That's true. But yeah, with your grandfather, you're probably not saying like YOLO or... Yeah, right. Right. Did you see that dank meme? Wait, that's not... Wait. (laughs) Dank means delicious. (laughs) Oh man, oh, well. <laughs> we're totally with the slang. Yeah. yeah, we're really we're really butchering this today. It's okay. So yeah, members of this community in Lajamanu, there aren't that many people. There are like under six hundred people in this community, and the younger members of the community just grew up speaking light world period as the dominant way of talking. So the code switching that their parents did, which was like speaking their Creole with their kids and then maybe speaking English with English speakers and Walpiri with the Walpiri speakers of the tribe. Their parents were code switching, but then the kids just kind of took the Creole that they were speaking and they formed a new language, which is not something that always happens when there's a Creole. Right. So that's what makes this like a really exciting thing. We just saw suddenly the evolution of a new language in the last... 40 years yeah and it's really interesting because it doesn't have a future tense yes it does have a past tense which is well it's not really past tense it's something that happened before or now which is denoted with an m suffix but there's not any similar structure for the future right and this suffix the m that indicates an event has happened previously or is currently happening, does not exist in any of Light World Peary's three mother languages, which is what's so interesting about it. So this is just something that the speakers of the language, who are all under 35, they kind of came to a consensus without even needing to discuss it because Mm -hmm. that's just what kids do the job of their brain is to produce language Mm -hmm. so they basically made their own language it's crazy yeah and it hasn't been written yet yeah it's just a spoken language right now they haven't worked out a spelling system or anything yeah next step yeah exactly yeah any of you linguists out there you want to go document a new language there you go go to Lajamanu in Africa. Af- ah, in Australia. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so we have an audio clip of Light World Perry. It's a kid's book. And what we're going to do is Rachel is going to read out some lines and then we're going to listen to the language. So you can hear the English version and then the World Perry version. Yeah. A little girl is holding her dog. The woman is happy with her dog, but they didn't see the monster. It is trying to sneak up on the dog. And she's pushing her friend on the swing. No, her little brother. He's going a swing swing, a nice bridge over. And the dog is looking at them. And the gentleman him looked them but. But that little girl didn't look at the dog. But that kind of one, he never looked at me and a gentleman. And you know, the monster got the dog. And and I go home and get him that gentleman. Okay. You can really hear how it's similar to English, but it's still not very comprehensible. Right. Cool. So I'm really very interested to see what happens with this next yeah do you think it could become a bit more widespread outside the community or do you think it will always just stay like a very localized language yeah that's a really good question because it's only spoken by 350 to 450 people and it's not i mean the community has grown in the last 50 years so i guess it just depends on how many people are going to stay there and procreate maybe Mm -hmm. yeah and how many people are going to move into the community and if it's going to become like the main language of the community as this generation gets older so what do you think I don't know I guess we would need to find out a bit more about the culture of the community and the geographical specifics 
But anyway, it's really interesting. Yeah, I think so. Nice. Okay, so it's time for the much anticipated Evolution of English Part Two. Yeah. Oh, two, two, two. <laughs> Yeah, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Me too. I got so into it the last time, and yeah, it was just way too much information for one episode. Yeah, exactly. Actually, we were planning on talking about one of these topics the last time, but we got really into it and just didn't have time to cover it last time. Yeah. So. so we saved it till now. So that's the first thing we're going to talk about. Shakespearean English... You know, you might have heard the rumor that the way Americans speak is closer to Shakespearean English than the way British people speak. And people who say that have also, I've also heard, you know, like British people after they lost the Revolutionary War, they wanted to differentiate themselves from their traitor colonial citizens. Which, okay, let's break that down a little bit. It's not crazy to say that we speak closer to Shakespearean English, but it's also not correct. Actually, yeah, exactly. You're right. So there are people who try to do Shakespeare in the OP, (laughs) original pronunciation. And actually, we have a little clip of Hamlet, which is Hamlet spoken in the original pronunciation of Shakespeare. To bear or not to bear. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a say of troubles, and by opposing, end them. To die, to slay, no more, and by a slave to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation to vote it to be wished. To die. To slip, to slip her chance to dream, aye, there's the rope. For in that slip of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this small coil must give us pause. And it just sounds like a mix of British, English, and maybe Irish, you know? Yeah. Because there's a lot of R, R. So. Right. Yeah, so that is one of the similarities, is the erotic nature of the R. Erotic? Mm-hmm spelled R-H-O-T. It's not like erotic or something. <laughs> but but erotic R's are like what Americans use, what the Irish use. Mm-hmm. A lot of like Scouse accents have the erotic R too, I believe. I thought and, Scottish mostly rolled their R's, but I might be wrong about that. Yeah. Yeah, you're probably right. But they do pronounce the R, not like the not the way the British do. non rotic British English just kind of drops a lot of their R's and then puts them in weird places, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of an example of that, but I, I can't now. Because I talking. know what you mean. Um, It's it's kind of like a, it's like a shadow R. Oh. When, because I had to like prove to somebody that this existed. <laughs> I was like, it's true. Sometimes there are R's where they don't belong. Um, I just always remember Kat Dealey on So You Think You Can Dance. Uh-huh. She would she would always say like Jessica Kerr and oh yeah, uh, whatever Carl. Oh yeah, or, it would be. It's I feel like it's to separate vowels sometimes. Jessica exactly, Rand. Jessica and mm-hmm. or Jessica Rand. Mm, yeah, that's the only time they say ours when they don't when they're not there. <laughs> <laughs> Although some accents, I think. Some different English accents, like, um, sorry, English people, I'm going to butcher this probably, but West Country, I believe, they say they're ours. Mm-hmm. If you think, like, Hagrid. Okay. Harry. Harry. Yeah, Harry. Potter. You're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I think our second biggest um, download source is from the UK, so you're welcome, people from the UK. You're welcome for me butchering my yeah. <laughs> English accent. <laughs> it's okay. But yeah, so during the time of Shakespeare, Brits actually did pronounce their R's. And when Shakespeare's plays were released, they weren't posh. Like, the language wasn't posh. At the time, it was just everyday speech. Right. 
Like, we think of Shakespeare and we're like, oh, Shakespeare, the language of whatever. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It sounds really posh to us. Yeah. And part of that is the accent that's typically done, the Shakespearean accent, which is not actually the original pronunciation. Mm -hmm. It's just because British English has a connotation of being posh, basically. Yeah. You think about quote-unquote, the Queen's English. Mm -hmm. Although what was very interesting to me about what we read was Queen Elizabeth I, what linguists have determined was that she actually spoke a very ordinary English, not, it was not like posh or not very refined. Mm -hmm. So she would have spoken more like a commoner. So it said like she would have pronounced the word servant like sarvent, I assume. Mm -hmm. And together as together... I, huh. I imagine together. Okay. together. So that's the way that ordinary people would have spoken at the time as well. Yeah. And they have determined this, by the way, because of letters that she wrote. And at this time, there was no standard spelling. So yeah. you spelled things as you pronounce them. Right. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a few minutes with the great vowel shift, GBS. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> I don't know keep why. saying it, it'll catch on. I don't know why that's so funny to me. It's like otherwise known as the GBS, like the articles I read about it, like, what why? Why do you put, it's just three syllables? <laughs> anyway, the way Americans pronounce path is closer to colonial times. So the some of our vowels i think are similar and you can hear that in the original pronunciation as well right and a theater professor who is also a dialect coach and he's done a lot of original pronunciation works by shakespeare he said that americans do have a leg up since the r's are more similar and some of the vowels but it's not the same Mm mm-hmm We don't speak, quote-unquote, Shakespeare in English. Right, right. I do think you can see remnants of English in, you might have heard this before too, like Appalachia. Mm -hmm. A lot of their metaphors, I think it is, are really close to metaphors in in Old English or Mm -hmm. English that was brought over in colonial times. Yeah, and I've thought it myself also just... People talk very outdated, Mm -hmm. like using a lot of vocabulary that is not used in England anymore, but then you hear it like in poetry or in folk songs or something Mm -hmm. that people still commonly say in Appalachia. Yeah, Yeah, it's super interesting. Yeah, so someone started a rumor (laughs) that people in Appalachia spoke this colonial English which is not really true. It's only in some of the vocabulary. Yeah. But it's still really cool. It is. is a good idea. Yeah. So, like, an example of that would be, like, a feared. Mm-hmm. A feared, yeah. And um, one that I was saying the other day, yonder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, actually, <clears throat> super tiny little side note. I worked at a language company when I was in the U.S., and... Somebody wanted a job teaching Spanish somewhere in the Midwest, Um, Mm -hmm. and he just randomly sent in his application. There was no job for him out there, but on his resume, he had, like, a paragraph about his linguistic background, and I wrote him back, and I was like, this is so cool, and he was like, you're the only recruiter who's ever actually read that (laughs) and responded (laughs) to it, but he said that um, his ancestors came from Spain when Spain was conquering that area of the Americas. So his family, people in that area, I wish I could remember which state it was in. I think I want to say like Arizona, Mm. but his family speaks the Spanish that colonial Spanish settlers spoke when they landed. So there are some minor differences in conjugation. So, huh. yeah, so I don't remember exactly. It was like like some letters just switched around at the end of the tool form. The um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but he gave some examples and it was really, really cool. That's so interesting. Yeah, it's really cool. Anyway, going back to English, 
the great vowel shift actually ended just after Shakespeare's time. And that's maybe that's why there are such big differences. Rachel was talking about earlier how there was no standardization for spelling when Victoria was queen. And that gives us a lot of insight into how things were pronounced. So that's how we know that the great vowel shift happened. Nobody's totally positive about how th- how things were pronounced, but the misspellings are a huge clue. So the misspellings betrayed the phonetic pronunciation of a word, and also they looked at the way songs were written, like what thing what words rhymed with each other. Yeah, which is really cool. Yeah, exactly. And I think also some Shakespearean uh, rhymes as well would have worked. Definitely, yeah. There are so many slant rhymes in Shakespeare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, slant for us. Mm-hmm, slant for us, exactly. But at the time, it probably would have worked better. Like, I read one, I think it was Shakespeare, love and prove. Right. So for us, that doesn't rhyme even a little bit. But <laughs> it said that prove would have been pronounced more like love. Ah, prove. Yeah. Maybe, maybe prove. Cool. So the Great Vowel Shift started in the 15th century, so right after Shakespeare's time. And it lasted over, it happened gradually um, for one to two hundred years. And it mostly affected the pronunciation of long vowels. So we have some examples of words that changed over time. I think we have about seven here that we pulled from Wikipedia. And they're super interesting. So we can go one at a time and discuss. Yeah. The first word is bite. Beat. Bait. Bite. Bite. The only thing that I would mention is it mostly affected long vowels. It moved the position of the tongue, so the sound came out the front of the mouth, and then like it went to the back of the mouth. So you listen to beat. Bite is originally beat, which you say like in the front of your mouth, and then bite is more is more toward the back. So it's a long vowel now. Right. Does and that make sense? Yeah, it makes. Well, to me it makes sense. Um, beat is also the tongue quite high, e. Yeah. And yeah. it becomes more open, like I. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So let's listen to another one and see if we can hear it. Okay. So this is boat. Boat, boat, boat. It was boat and now it's boat. So it, I feel like it's almost the tongue relaxing, you know? Yeah, it's also the lips relaxing because o oh, mm. is a quite oh, a uh-huh. tight sound with mm-hmm. the lips very closed, and boat is a bit more relaxed. Mm-hmm. The same thing happened with um, house. So house was hoos, and it became house. And I feel like somehow that just like the Great Vowel Shift maybe didn't really get to Canada, you know? <laughs> yeah, some words hung around. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right, the next one we have is boot. Boat, boot, boot. The reverse happened with this one. Boat, boot, boot. Mm-hmm, yeah, that's basically what I heard. Yeah, it sounds like the opposite of what happened with boat. Yeah, that's kind of funny. Boat and boot kind of switched the meanings almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> funny. So the next one we have is mate, like he's my mate. Mat, met, mate. So, so it was a that's a short a, right? Ah, uh, I mean it's the ah and father. Yeah. It's a very open sound. Mat, mm-hmm. met, mate. It's more it's more of a German sound. Mm-hmm. actually or roman sound yeah definitely so that one actually became a bit more closed mm-hmm. mate 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 so actually each of these words is, is starting with a different vowel so we're looking at all the different vowel sounds and a lot of it was diphthongization so mot is one vowel and a diphthong if you don't know is two vowel sounds blended into one mm-hmm. and mate is definitely a diphthong it's an a and an e sound mm-hmm. yeah so the next one we've got is meat as in m-e-a-t met meat meat 
So, yeah, this one goes from fairly open and long, kind of a long sound, mm-hmm. met, and to a more closed sound that's shorter, meet. Yeah. There's a graph of these shifts, and it's really interesting because, like, a lot of the sounds that were originally one sound became another sound together. Yeah. Not all of them. There were some exceptions, but a lot of these sounds were consistent in the shifting, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's so interesting. It's almost kind of like circular, right? Like, I'm trying to Mm -hmm. remember the graph in my mind, but so like this one went to this one, this one went to another one, and almost like in a circle or something. Exactly, yeah. It's really weird because it's not like people had charted out the all the different vowels and language and just decided to move them. strategically in a circle but yeah it's funny that that it was consistent yeah pretty much really interesting so the next one is meet but m-e-e-t meet 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 so and still it was different from it was close to m-e-a-t the first time but it wasn't exactly the same yeah yeah meet I think it was something like that. Yeah. Which is almost like an I sound. Right. Yeah. An I a in, short I. in modern English. And that one definitely got shorter. Meat. Good point. Yeah. Meat. Meat. Yeah. Meat. <laughs> <Meet. laughs> yeah. That's true. Okay, one more. This is out. And this is where you're going to hear what I mean about Canada. <laughs> Oot. Oat. Out. Out. Interesting. So mm-hmm. this one went through four different phases. Oot. Oat. Out. Out. Mm-hmm. Although I said the last one in my very American accent, but, <laughs> but he said a little bit more like out. Yeah. But the prior one, the one right before the modern one was out. Out. Alt. Alt. Yeah, it's more of like an A-U instead of an O-U. Alt. 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 Yeah. Alt. Yeah, it's a bit of a darker sound and a bit further back. Mm, yeah, it's almost like we brought it forward a little bit. Yeah. So. Alt. Really interesting. Yeah. And this is what you were saying about Canadians. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Alt. Alt. Yeah, um, the other words, let me see if I wrote it down. Oh, yeah, house was hoos, um, mode was mood. So before the great vowel shift, I watched this video about it. Basically, before the great vowel shift, we pronounced long vowels more in the front of our mouth, and then we moved toward the back of our mouth. So house was hoos, mode was mood, and we also diphthongized vowels. Yeah. But why? Why did this happen? Yeah, so it's not really clear, right? But there mm-hmm. are several different theories. Yeah, and it's probably a combination of all of them, to be honest. Yeah, so. they're all pretty valid, I would say. Yeah, yeah, it's really interesting. So part of it, this was around the time of the Black Plague, so people moved from Southern England to Eastern England, and so there was that mixing of accents Mm -hmm. at that point another one actually is kind of funny because we already talked about this in shakespearean english you know after the revolutionary war it's said that the british changed the way they spoke to differentiate themselves from the americans and after the change in english rule by the french when the french were no longer in charge that's when this great vowel shift happened as well so Um, The English were either hyper-correcting, like trying to not make themselves sound French. Mm -hmm. So that might have been part of why they they changed the way they spoke. Right. So it could have been what you said, that the war with France and the general anti-French sentiments caused a feeling of wanting to differentiate themselves and become less French. Mm -hmm. So they started hypercorrection. But there's another theory that states that the prestige of French, so we know that French was regarded as very prestigious and spoken by the elite, by the high classes. So the middle classes might have wanted to sound a bit more like that. And so they hypercorrected, but their vowels did not sound more French. They sounded actually less French. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. So... We don't really know which of these took place or if it was a combination of the three, but it changed Mm -hmm. so much of the way that English was spoken and then hence written. Right. 
Uh, um, one more theory, though. It might be that highly influential rulers also had speech impediments, which is what happened in Spain. I've heard um, that, but then I've also heard that that's untrue. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I believe it. I mean, I like I like it so much that I believe it. <laughs> that it was because where Spain colonized, there's no there's no theta or you know the stereotypical lisp that's done in Spanish, which is just on the C and the Z. Mm-hmm. But so what I heard was whichever king it was that was in power after the Spanish started colonizing, I don't remember which one it was, maybe it was Philip, had a lisp. And so it became like courtly to speak with a lisp Mm -hmm. so that you wouldn't offend the king by using the using an S. (laughs) I think that's, I mean, I love that explanation. Maybe it's not true, but there is a possibility that some um, English rulers had something similar, and then that was the way you spoke. But Yeah, it's interesting to think about, though. And English is not the only language that went through a major vowel shift. There was also German, Italian, French, and Spanish also went through that. But the difference is that they changed their spelling rules to reflect those changes. Yeah. Good job, other languages. Yeah. So that kind of explains why you can look at a word in English and be like totally wrong about how it's pronounced. <laughs> Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Enough. I know it's really hard as an English teacher sometimes. Well, it's not really hard for me. It's just a little sad for I feel a little bad for my students sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's like, definitely frustrating for them. Yeah. Yeah. And like the G H S that always sound different and yeah. But it is good. Like I can tell such a huge difference in my my second graders versus my eighth graders. So I teach two grades right now. I teach second and eighth grade. And my second graders, whom I taught as first graders, are just so much more ready to learn and pronounce correctly. Oh, wow. And then my eighth graders are just, like, embarrassed by everything around them. (laughs) And I'm like, say your S's, say your TH, like, show me your tongue. And they're just like, no. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the great vowel shift. Yeah. GVS. So I think that kind of wraps up what we have for this installment of the evolution of English, right? Yeah, I think pretty much. So if you enjoyed this episode and you want evolution of English part three, you can just let us know. Maybe in another eight episodes we can do that. Yeah. And we'd love to hear from you if you have any experience with this and you know anything else about it that you'd like to share, you can comment on the show notes. Yeah, any linguists out there. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. So now it's time for our Lost in Translation moment. Yes. (laughs) So this is a Lost in Translation, Lost in Culture translation, if that makes any sense. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, a lot of times when we go to a country that we're not raised in, there are things that you just don't understand, right? So I was at a party last week, and there were a lot of people there who were recently arrived in Spain. A lot of noobs, in other words, like Americans and Brits. And so everything's cool, you know, I'm thinking, wow, Americans are really loud, and everybody's drinking and being very loud. But having a good time, right? And then about 11.30, so it started early, it started around 8, someone comes, one of the guys who lived there, and was like, saying something, and I was like, this is some weird inside joke that I'm not privy to. I don't understand the context, blah, blah, blah. So it turns out it was not an inside joke, and it was, in fact, a real event that had just taken place, which was someone took a sh- in the bidet. <laughs> no. No. And yeah, so bidets are not very common in the US. I think they're also not very common in the UK. And that's so awkward. It was very awkward and it was never discovered who who did it, but How? Oh. 
but then it was like overflowing and everyone was horrified oh my god I bet the person who did it left. Yes, that was the You gotta theory. find out who left the party early. It was, everyone <laughs> was, was like, who left? <laughs> I can't imagine. Anyway, <sighs> bidets are not for that. That's what the toilet is for. <laughs> oh my god, like, how do you look at it and you're like, oh cool, I have a choice. I can <laughs> choose. <laughs> You know, it has one of those little drains that just has, like, little tiny holes. I don't know yeah. how you think that. I guess you have to be really drunk, maybe. I guess so, yeah. So, oh, that's bad. That was... It was unbelievable, really. Like, <laughs> everyone was in shock. And also having to clean it up, you know. Yeah, I, I know. That's, like, my next... That's where my mind goes, like... Who had to put on the rubber gloves and take a paper towel and, like, actually move it? Yeah. And clean up the floor. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That makes me so sad. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a little cultural lost in translation. Mm, Yeah. Go for the go for the one with the big hole in it, guys. Yeah, and the thing that you already know, like people know toilets, just use that. Yeah. If in doubt, you know that yeah. it works. Yeah, don't like don't take a risk. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for that moment, Rachel. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Well, to send us your Lost in Translation moment, go to the contact section on our website. That's languagenerdsdoearth.com. And you can record your own moment on our voice recorder. And like Rachel just did, it doesn't have to be a language, Lost in Language Translation moment. It can be a cultural faux pas as well. Definitely. And we know that you have those too, so... Everybody has them. Yeah. Just, just give them to it's us. Inevitable. That's all really. we ask. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so subscribe to our podcast. That way you can get notified whenever we release a new episode. And yeah, you'll mm-hmm. stay up to date. Yeah. And make sure you follow us on social media. We are on YouTube. We have a Facebook page. We're on Instagram. We're on Twitter. And we're on Pinterest. So that way we'll be right in your face. All the places. Yeah. <laughs> leave us a review on itunes please pretty pretty please if you review us on itunes then more people who are interested in language culture and travel are more likely to find us there yeah and we'll give you a shout out and more importantly we'll love you forever yeah and you'll make us happy <laughs> <laughs> and yeah tell your friends or tell your family that you think might enjoy it if you have a globe trotting cousin turn them on to it yeah tell them they gotta know and our next episode is going to be about fall festivals well thank you so much for listening everybody and have a great week yes thanks bye, bye.